this is part two of this tale. Make sure you catch part one right here. Also, as a correction, I want to be abundantly clear. Mr. Harrison had nothing to do with this guitar. There was some confusion in that first episode. His name was only thrown into the mix with those photos to confuse and trick me even further. Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today we learn about a very historic guitar. This thing right here is Slash's very first signature guitar. Now this wasn't his guitar obviously, but it's the very first Slash signature model that was publicly available anyways. We'll learn a little bit about the one that predates this one here in a second, but let's go ahead and get this beauty open. For many a years I've teased you guys with this review and demo. Inside here sleeps the 1996-97-ish slash snake pit. It's got a relief carving, it's got a snake on the fretboard, it's a fancy boy, and it is pretty darn cool. So let's go ahead and learn a little bit about the history of this elusive beast. Okay, so the Snake Pit Les Paul was first introduced in 1996 in an initial batch of 50 of them. It took about two years for them to complete, so you can find them all the way until about 1998. However, it's kind of hard to tell what year yours is because they just have an SLXXX serial number going up to about 100. There were two batches of them. The first run of 50, they'll have a little certificate of authenticity that says, hey, we only made 50 of these, but there was such a huge demand for this guitar that they made another batch of 50. Now, I heard rumors that they didn't quite make all the 50, but that could just be my memory failing me. But there's at least 100 of these, and Slash got four of these as part of his endorsement deal. Three production level ones and the prototype. How do you know you found the prototype? The snake on the front is actually rotated another 90 degrees, so like if you hung it up on a stand, you would see the snake displayed properly rather than when you're playing it. Unfortunately, they were stolen in 1998 during a break-in of his personal studio. So the one that you actually see him use is apparently one that Gibson built him to replace those ones. So if you ever see the prototype slash snake bit, its rightful owner is still slash. You might not want to buy that one. <laughs> But the initial retail price, as far as I can find online, was 5,000 USD. Even adjusted for inflation, that's only $8,800. Which is kind of cheap for an art guitar like this. A real relief carving out of the top, fancy inlays, something like this today would probably cost about $25,000 brand new with Slash's name attached to it. But just a general art guitar, anywhere between like fifteen dollars to 20000 brand new. So it's no surprise that the used market used to dictate these were worth somewhere between thirty dollars to $50,000. Right now there's only one up for a hundred grand, but nobody's buying it as of yet. However, six years prior in 1990, Slash actually did four custom orders himself, and that is technically the first Slash signature guitar. It kind of has a washed out red orangish finish to it with piercing yellow binding on it, but he ordered them from Gibson during a NAM show. But then after that, there was a run in 2004, and then they skipped about four years, and then basically from 2008 to the current day, there's been so many Gibson models. I personally counted approximately 27 Gibson models that have Slash's name attached to them, from a couple of Firebirds, a Double Neck, which you can check out that review and demo here, and just a whole slew of Les Pauls. That's not including any type of Epiphone guitars. And yes, if you happen to like the look of this thing, they did make an Epiphone version as well. It sells for crazy money in its own right. It just has a snake decal on it though. It doesn't have the fancy fretboard or anything like that, but it is available. So what is the rest of the story of the snake pit? Why does Slash actually have this snake on it to begin with? Slash's snake pit is actually the name of a super group that was founded in 1994. It consisted of Guns N' Roses members, Matt Sorum, Gilby Clark, and obviously Slash himself, You've got Mike from Alice in Chains and Eric Dover from the band Jellyfish. And this snake slash polymerization with a bone was actually the album cover for their It's Five O'Clock Somewhere album. It was designed by Slash's brother, Ash Hudson. And for Gibson, it was carved out by a man named Bruce Kunkel who worked for them at that point in time. He was the custom art carver. He did a whole bunch of stuff. He did all the paint work. And when I talk to him, he absolutely hates the snake yet till today. <laughs> Only because he had to do so many of these things. But unfortunately, if you've been following my channel, this is not actually a real slash snake pit. I was scammed out of 15,000 odd dollars to purchase what I thought was real many of years ago, but if you want to learn all about that story, you can check out this video right here. Today, we need to find out what the heck is this thing. 
Bruce Kunkel, he thought it might be a made-over Gibson USA to kind of make it look like a snake pit as close as humanly possible to trick someone, and it was just good enough for that. And it's been a good five years since I've had this thing on the workbench, but I vaguely remember agreeing with what I had saw there. But you also have to remember, my experience level has changed a lot in identifying Gibson guitars since when I first got this thing. Like, I was just a beginner at that point in time. Now I'm very well versed in looking at things. When it comes to telling real luthier-made replicas versus the real deal, it can get tricky. This is not some cheap Chinese fake that you can order off of AliExpress for three. 350 bucks. This is a quality instrument, it just needs a little bit of TLC. I mean, first impressions of this, just feeling the neck, I can tell there's something up here because it has such a sloped shoulder to it. It's kind of an interesting feeling right there. Then obviously everything that we talked about in the last video. The weird finish that has like the metallic flake or dust or whatnot in it. Obviously some of the coloring being wrong, some of the hardware that didn't quite exist yet when this guitar was produced. And the serial number just not quite being the right font and like the finish. The color is actually called cranberry. This is just a little bit darker than that than what they would be. You can check out some examples of real ones for that. On top of all the fanciness of the guitar, I do want to take a second to appreciate the case of these. This is a very early custom art historic Gibson case. The way that you can tell the early ones is the logo is up here, so like when you open it people can see it right there. Whereas on the later ones, they kind of moved it more down here, more towards the middle. I just happen to have one that I can show you both. Obviously the font is a little bit different, this is much more bold, but it's really the exterior of the case that you should be paying attention to here. These have a very printed snakeskin-like vibe to them. It's just a very interesting feeling as compared to the other ones. It's just like a basic modern day Gibson custom shop case just with a different logo. They made a lot more of these than they did these. So whenever you see one of these things show up for sale separately, they're worth a lot of money because they're the original case to guitars like these, as well as like the original Florentine and Bantam customs. The handles are a little bit different as compared to the other ones but it's really the interior that's also changed a lot. So here's the newer one. It's basically, once again, just like the modern day custom shop cases that they still use yet today. This is just like the very first iteration of it before they just switched it to Gibson Custom. You can see it's got a flap like we're used to seeing here, the red crushed velvet interior. But then we go over here and it's more of like a, a felt material rather than the crushed velvet, but it has extra support down here with these big blocks that you don't have on this other model. They just switched to this light cushioning system. So you do have a little bit more room going on here. Here. They've got this large case block up here to keep the guitar secure, whereas they did away with that on later runs. Same thing with right here. You don't see that on a lot of cases. That locks it into place on the single neck rest, whereas this one, they did away with that but gave it a second neck rest, which is technically superior. These guys were made by TKL in Canada, and the lid actually goes this way, which is the opposite of what we do modern day. Whereas this one, it opens like most cases like this. It has the same kind of snakeskin print interior here, and this is actually on a hinge, so you don't have to worry about that breaking. That's one of the very few Gibson cases that actually utilizes that instead of just the fabric keeping it together. That is a premium feature that they likely cut out to uh, save costs on, but only one neck rest technically on these guys. So a very cool, very different case from what came later. So if you ever have a snake pit that doesn't come with this case, uh, you should be a little bit leery. I would say the build quality actually feels better on these. It's a slightly bigger case too, and it feels like it was made out of heavier duty woods as compared to the newer ones. But there's a quick comparison for you. But to learn more about the Slash Snake Pit fake, let's go ahead, throw it on the workbench, and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside Fake Snake, let's go ahead and see what is going on. So our pickups, as I had mentioned in the last episode, they are the Seymour Duncan Signature Slash set. The first time I got this guitar, I figured, well, that makes sense. Slash Signature pickups in his signature guitar, except for at that point in time, these things weren't out. Now, reading up online, apparently this is the same style of pickups that did come in the originals. However, they didn't have this signature yet. So those have definitely been replaced. 
But it's reasonings like that, that there were no photos even yet today that I can find documenting the inside of a snake pit last Paul or some of the fine details because had those have been available, I would have never got scammed on this thing. It'd been so easy to be like, oh no, that's not right because look at this real one. Here's that, that, and that. You don't have to find owners of it and then beg them to tear theirs apart because some guys, they think it's taboo to do that. You don't hurt a guitar tearing it apart as long as you're careful and you know what you're doing. So that's why I do what I do today. I share all these videos of guitars with you guys. So, hey, if somebody buys a, especially a high-end guitar, they can cross-check it with my videos or pay me to take a look at the guitar on their behalf. So in many ways, I owe a lot to this guitar for teaching me that's what I should do and evolving my show into what it is today. But anyways, the meat and potatoes, let's find out what this thing is. With the pickups out of the way, is that a long neck tenon? No, it's not. Somebody's actually just taken a little router bit and made it look like it has one. Sneaky, sneaky. I believe the original snake pits would have a long neck tenon being a custom shop, but again, I've never seen inside one, but one day I will get a real one to document. So this never happens again. But this, this is interesting. You see this like uneven route right here? This is something you find in this era of Gibson Les Paul standards. So I really truly do believe this is a Gibson USA body of some sort. Further proof is in the neck pickup, but you have to get your light out to see it. There's some markings in there, and we've definitely seen those in real Gibsons. Usually up here there's some sort of a color code, but unfortunately they just happen to put that route right where the initial color code would be. So I am very confident that this started life as a Gibson USA, at least the body. I mean, there's a possibility that it could have been retopped, but looking at this top, I'm guessing no. There are standards that look just like this that were available then. So for fun, the middle position reads 4.97K ohms, our bridge pickup reads 8.02, and the neck position, whoa, 13.2, wow. That seems a bit strange. <laughs> but then again, I'm not really familiar with this pickup set. And inside the pickup cavity, we can indeed see it has a real maple top of the mahogany body. Now, whether they put a veneer over top of the real maple top, I guess I can't really say for certainty, but I guess it's also possible that they could have done that, but I'm just gonna guess it's the original top from this body. But there's scratches and nicks and dings along this thing. It just looked like a real snake bit that had been played. The coloration and the pattern isn't quite right, but if you've never seen an original one, you would never know. I mean, this is, good artwork. It's not that inferior. It's just not quite as evil looking as an original. Same thing with this finish. It's not quite as vibrant, I guess you could say, but it does appear to have a two-piece maple top. You know what? There we can see it. Les Paul 6T. So this was a Les Paul standard with a 60s neck that was labeled as a plus top. Yep, that is exactly what we were looking for right there. 100% confirmed unless somebody just wrote that in the pickup cavity. But at that point, if you're trying to pass it off as a custom shop, you would kind of want to hide things like that. So that is 100% what this thing was, a 60s Les Paul standard. But now we get to the bridge. Why does it have an ABR1 bridge? I'm, I'm not sure because at this point in time, like if it was a Les Paul classic, it could have an ABR1, but this one would have normally had a Nashville style bridge. So I'm not sure how they converted that to an ABR1, but they did. It's possible that they could have put like a veneer top over this, but this looks like what a 60s plus Les Paul would be. So I'm a little bit stumped on that, but at least we know this is a real Gibson body. The tailpiece is a full weight one. It has a line going all the way across, so that's probably just a replacement in general. So at the very minimum, this thing had to have been refinished because this relief carving, they likely just carved it outside of the fact and then painted it and then finished over top of it because with real relief carvings, they actually take it when the wood actually has the height so it's not completely sanded down yet and they carve it into the top so it actually stands up. You can feel it. So this one, it's not a flat decal. They actually made it look real. It stands up on top of the guitar. It just was likely glued on top, would be my guess. But now going around the body, when this came to me, it actually had kind of a shaven down switch tip. And if I remember correctly, I actually have a uh, an 80s part on here. I might've actually swapped that back when I got this guitar, because that doesn't quite look like an 80s one anymore. But it looks so strange being small. I wanted to make it look, you know, at least semi-what nicely. 
But moving along here, you can see some nicks and dings. I mean, it just looked like a real snake pit that had been played. I love the wood grainage you have underneath this and the flame top over top of all that. You get the snake here. Granted, if you compare this to a real snake pit, the colors just aren't right. The design on the snake is a little bit different, but this is quality artwork. If you like the slash snake pit snake, my wife hates this design. Like, not even the fact that this one was just fake and whatnot, but she just hates this guitar in general. I don't get it. I mean, for me, it's it's the first Slash signature guitar. You gotta love this thing. I wouldn't normally be a big fan of what this looks like in general, but I like it because of what it represents. But continuing on, we can see it's a two-piece top. And looking in here, I was trying to see if the seam actually lined up. However, I don't see the seam lined there, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Okay, we can see it in the neck pickup cavity. I mean, that doesn't still completely rule out that it might be a veneer top over top of a real maple top in order to do that ABR1 conversion job, but that's just one of those things I don't think we'll ever be able to know. But we've got the kind of correct style of knobs here. Now, when I had first gotten it, one of these had a chip. The ones used on the actual snake pits are a little bit darker in hue than these. Pretty much the only anomaly here on the top is somebody has two different screws in here, like they were very close together. So I think normally it'd be installed like this, but they have it lined up with that one. So the neck pickup is very, very slightly crooked because of that. The screws that they actually use to secure these down are not the correct style. They're more of a dome shape instead of being flat like most of the original ones have. So as far as the top goes, very convincing, right? I mean, sure, you got some weird stuff under the finish, but we'll be able to see that better on the back. I think it's time to move on from our mahogany body. If it was a standard, it would have nine hole weight relief and our maple top into our mahogany neck and an ebony fretboard. So let's just take a look at all this. If this did indeed start life as a standard, as the body suggests, that means this whole fretboard was likely replaced at one point in time in order to put the ebony fretboard on here and then do all your snake inlays and whatnot. That probably took a lot of time to do. And here's a really good evidence of that. You see how this fret nib doesn't actually line up with the end of the fret. That's like just not a possibility. I mean, I suppose somebody could have went too far with their chisel shaping the fret ends, but it just looks to me like you can see very small gaps that they took the original binding on this guitar off. Like you can see a gap right here that they filled in with like a little bit of epoxy and then other ones just have a gap. So they took the original binding off, put a new fretboard on and to save cost, they put the original binding back on. That's why some of those don't quite perfectly line up. That would be my best guess as to what happened. It's either they made new binding and it just wasn't all that good. But if you're really looking, you can definitely tell there's something fishy going on there. There's a small crack in the fretboard right here. Here's another good area where you can see like some glue had seeped out, like they might have cracked the fretboard putting these inlays in or something. There's a small dent on the fretboard right here, but you can just see all kinds of tooling marks on the edges, which you do see on real Gibsons. So at that point in time, I was just like, okay, well, is, is this what it is? I mean, you gotta remember, I had never had a modern day Gibson as high end as this when I had first saw this guitar. So I didn't know what to expect. I mean, this was back in the days where I refused to buy anything made after 1979. Like, can you guys believe that? There was once a Trogley who hated 80s Gibsons. I thought they were inferior. Boy, I was missing out on a lot of cool stuff. Spotlights help convert me. 80s Gibsons are some of my favorite now. But anyways, we've got 22 frets on this guy and the snake inlay, they use mother of pearl for the bottom, then you get abalone for the top. And that does appear to be the real deal on here. I was telling you guys in the other episode, what makes this one not look right is the eyes a little bit too big. The head's not flat. The tongue is actually painted on rather than inlaid like it should be. It's got these weird kissy lips and all the segments on the snake's body should be parallel, meaning not kind of tilting this way, that way, this way. I mean, more similar to like what you're seeing right here, but this was definitely probably all hand done right here. It looks good though. I'll commend whoever did this. There's just some, uh, you know, reworking weird stuff going on, but that's the fake snake. Still maintains the 12 inch fretboard radius, but we have a 1.65 inch nut width which increases to 2.03 by the 12th. First fret neck depth of 0.84 and 0.93 by the 12th. 
I mean, I would say that lines up pretty consistently with a 60s standard neck. However, that nut seems a bit thin. But then again, it's just been a while since I've had one of those. Here's what that looks like at the first fret and the 12th fret. C-shaped neck. So this nut clearly has lacquer on it, but it's not actually seated properly. So maybe when they rip the fretboard off, they kind of mess that up. So I put some painter's tape under here just to shim it, and it works okay. But to back up the story of how worn this thing looks, there actually is fretware on this thing. So the collector who had it before me, they, they must have played it. I mean, especially right here. Like, it's not so much in the cowboy cord areas. Like, you can see some. But it's like on that fifth fret right here, just kind of going up here. So this guitar definitely needs a little bit of a level recrown and setup job, in my opinion. Because there are some frets that were buzzy. At least when I first got it. Like, there were some actual dead frets. But that's why I wanted my luthier guy at the time to, you know, look into it a bit more. But now the headstock, look at that. It's got the actual real Gibson truss rod style in here. So that tells you it's not some import fake. Despite the truss rod cover saying, yes, I am an imported guitar fake truss rod cover that says slash. This is just not right at all. I mean, you see the loops at the top. That's not how a real one is. Now keep in mind the slash ones were special in metal, but it would still be the exact same shape, just a small semicircle bump instead of the full circle. And there should be some sort of a circle down here rather than being completely flat. That's what you see on all chips. And so this definitely came from not the right source, but you know, it kind of looks the part on this. Something else that gives the truss rod cover away is you got one screw that looks like what it should. And then you've got one very strange one that should not normally be on a truss rod cover screw but the neck itself does appear to be authentic. So then we get here. That means somebody probably scraped off the original Gibson veneer and put a new one on it. They did a horrendous job refinishing the top of this. I mean, you see all that? When Bruce Kunkel said metallic junk, this is the part he was talking about. I just thought it was like sparkles in the finish or something. Again, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what to expect, but this is where you can see a Gibson that doesn't have the shrinking around the logo looks so strange, doesn't it? That's how you tell it's not the real deal, but it did get the correct abalone inlay on there. But you can see like some fake relicking right here. I think they were trying to do that just to play off, okay, this was a player's one that somebody actually gigged out. That's why some of these parts have been replaced and stuff. It was a very elaborate scam here because this does happen on some guitars. Like check out my Les Paul GT review. That guitar has very similar wear and that's a legit thing. Now back here, we've got a couple of additional red flags, but let's go in here. So the back control plate, Obviously, this is Gibson USA stuff. They have the metal base plate. Now, sure, we could take that off, wire it back up, clean up the solder job, because these are just appalling. Put the style of pots that they actually put in a real snake pit to make this an even more convincing fake at that point. But somebody's got the orange drop capacitors in here, which, I mean, Slash is known for using, but this is definitely not what a custom shop one would look like. However, I mean, the routing and everything else, it actually does look correct. The only thing a bit strange here that also proves this is a refinish is the fact that they have a screw right here for the grounding tab. Now, what's actually kind of funny is you would sometimes see that on 80s models, <laughs> but I don't think that's what this is based on the other evidence we've been seeing here. So here's what the toggle switch cavity looks like. Uh, nothing seems out of place here, but the fact that that screw has red paint over top of it means that was probably in there as they were respraying this into the red color. And of course, they've got that metallic junk in here. I mean, it was likely just because it was a dirty environment that they were doing this refinish in, but it feels good. Like, I'm not convinced it's 100% nitro, but it wouldn't surprise me. Like, whoever did this, they had an idea of how to make this guitar look good. They just didn't quite fully execute it right. I always thought the binding looked strange on this guitar for the body, especially in the cutaway area. It's like a very peach color. Now what that is, now that I have a little bit more experience, is that's probably the red finish bleeding off into it, or they changed it from the original binding that was on the standard because they wanted it to look more like the aged snake pit one. I mean, you can see the color difference between that very traditional cream jack plate versus the binding that would normally match. So that's probably some sort of a binding bleed. We've got Schaller strap locks on this right now. That's how it came to me. 
But that's what the edge looks like. I mean, everything looks all right here. Obviously, you've got some fake wear or just spots where the finish didn't catch in a few areas. Or they uh, buffed through, more likely. But now where things get really interesting. This neck. So this is supposed to be a 60s neck standard, right? I mean, once again, we've got all the dots in the finish. Looking up here, I mean, it's definitely a mahogany neck. You can see the wood grain. But my biggest question for this one, once I found out what it was, you know, being a 60s Les Paul standard, where's the serial number? Because those would have been impressed in the back of the headstock. Whereas this now has the slash serial number, but I don't see any evidence of where that old serial number was. Like, you can't just make wood not show an impression. So that's kind of why I always thought this was more so like a Les Paul classic that had an ink stamp serial number to begin with, because that would also help explain our ABR1 bridge. And maybe they had similar markings in them. Maybe I'm reading that wrong, because then that would make sense. But if this was indeed a standard, there's no way they could have done that unless they put like a veneer and somehow hid it within the wood grain, but I, I don't see anything like that. But I thought I'd take a couple of the tuners off. Actually, I was only going to take this one off and then I saw this. What the heck? <laughs> it's like their new veneer for the top didn't quite line up, so they had to readjust where that hole normally was. I, I've never seen that on a real Gibson. So that's something strange, but not all of them are like that. So I did it leave the factory like that a little wonky. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. The tuners that are on here are Gibson Deluxe branded Klusen style tuners, and they say made in Japan on the back. Not sure if that's error correct for this or not. But here's the biggest nail in the coffin, in my opinion. If you look around the edge of the neck, you can see this like color around it. That makes me think it's possible a brand new neck was put on this guitar because that just might be the glue seeping out and then it caught the finish. That could be a telltale sign of, you know, this has a new neck on it, which is possible because again, as I was telling you, if it started life as a standard, they would need to hide that serial number somehow. It's either that or keep in mind, these guys, they weren't the best at finishing guitars. It's very likely that paint just got built up right there as it dripped down off the side of the neck or whatnot. But that is something that I noticed there. And perhaps that's why this neck feels just a tad different to me on this side of it. It's either that or as they were sanding off the original finish, it kind of changed the contour along here. It is a pretty comfortable neck though. But anyways, if anybody actually owns the real SL072, I would love to see photos of it. <laughs> but that's, I remember that being another thing that confused me because since this would technically, technically be a second run slash, I thought maybe, okay, are some of these weird, strange differences actually because this is a second run? Did they have a different snake? I remember that being a question in my mind sometimes. And again, that just goes back to, there's not a lot of documentation of this model out there. So there you go, that's how I got fooled. You know, up close, when you really look at it and you know your stuff, you can see that there's some things off. But from just a couple feet away, this definitely looks the part and is enough to fool most people that look at it. Especially if we were to refinish it, clean up some of the dirty finish, and swap out some of the obvious fake parts like that slash truss rod cover. The only thing you couldn't really fix is the dopey looking snake as compared to the original scary looking one. So I hope you enjoyed solving this mystery with me today. Well, at least solved as much as humanly possible without knowing who did this work. As far as the weight, about nine and a half pounds at nine pounds, 7.3 ounces. All right, we actually have Michael Weber to do the demo of this one. He recorded that last year, so that's just old footage that I've kept for a while. I don't have the direct audio recordings, but hey, we do have the camera audio, and then I'll do a little cameo play as well. Just kidding. You guys thought I was going to forget to do the blacklight test. So I remember telling the seller it doesn't glow under blacklight. It does glow. But maybe this has just developed over the couple of years that I've owned it, but not as much as I would expect. So that was the back. I mean, the top actually does glow now. Again, I, I, I really don't remember what it was when I first had it, but you can see the snake definitely glows. So just because a guitar glows does not mean it's the original finish. It just means it has some age 
or it's just that kind of finish that glows right away. It's mainly only useful for determining touch-ups because you'll see like this finish doesn't glow as much as the area right here signifying a headstock break, which isn't the case on this particular guitar. That's what this one looks like under black light. Not really too much to show you here because it was likely all refinished at the same time, especially that neck area that looks to have been sprayed at the same time. As were the sides, so now let's get to the playing demo. <laughs> Hear how it sounds in my hands. I'd say it sounds pretty darn good. 
Now, there are some fretting issues on here. Like these could use like a heavy duty polish, not just a steel wool job, because some of them do feel a bit scratchy. <laughs> Nothing too crazy, but there's a few frets where you can kind of feel like a small ridge. Now let's go ahead and try some distortion. Sounds pretty darn good. Definitely a microphonic bridge pickup, but you know, that adds to some of the cool tones out of this thing. Definitely sounds like Slash. I mean, it's his signature pickups inside of USA Les Paul. So <laughs> I'd imagine it would sound good, right? <laughs> Now that we know all about the fake pit, what are my final thoughts on this thing? I actually really enjoyed playing this guitar. Sometimes, you know, there's some issues on the frets where you can like feel a little bit of give where they need to be a little bit more highly polished. And then in other locations, it just completely chokes out like towards the top of the neck. Like it's not too bad, but like definitely right here. It just chokes out. So maybe I just need to raise the bridge, actually get the saddles properly notched and then get a proper refinish that doesn't have all the weird junk in it. And this would definitely be very convincing for most people. But the tones, they were all there. But I mean, they're slash signature pickups, so I would imagine so in a USA Les Paul. So, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed finally learning the complete tale of this guitar, as well as getting to see it on the workbench to see what this thing actually is. It appears to be some sort of a remade Les Paul, so it's a real Gibson, it just, it, it didn't leave the factory like this. It's kind of like a semi-what good conversion job, but they kind of failed when it came to the finishing aspects. But all right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share this video with a friend who would enjoy it, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.
As always, if you're interested in being the next owner of one of these demo guitars, you can check them out on my website, troglisguitarshow.com. There's some links in the description.